Friends, good morning. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church. Let me welcome you to this hour of worship on the second Sunday of Advent, whether you're here in the room or live streaming across uh, one of our various platforms. Uh, we're so glad that you've chosen to be in worship today. Before we begin our time together, I'm going to invite you to stand, uh, to move about the room, and let's say good morning and welcome one another as if we're welcoming Christ himself. Well, again, it's uh, good to be together this morning. I invite you to take out your cell phones. It's a great time to silence them. Uh, also, a great time to check in using our text message platform. Please do let us know that you're here, especially if you're with us uh, for the first time. Uh, give us some contact information. And when you do use uh, this platform, whether it's your first time or a hundredth time, uh, we'll send you a link to the bulletin. We don't have a bulletin during this service, uh, but in that bulletin are some announcements for the week that are similar to the ones that you see in our weekly email blast. If you'd like to walk away with a hard copy, we always have some up here as well. But all of our liturgy for this service is up on the screen. Uh, as we do each and every Sunday, we have a Stephen minister in our chapel down this hallway to the left. Uh, that person is there to meet anyone uh, in prayer, if you have particular prayer requests you'd like to bring forward, they're there to pray with you and for you, again, immediately following worship. Also, immediately following worship, we have uh, the opportunity to hear from our scholar in residence, uh, Chris Holmes, and our director for worship, Jens Korndorfer, who are putting together a lecture on next week's choir concert. So next week, we have our choir concert around 10 a.m. It'll start in the sanctuary. Uh, they'll be lecturing on the content of that concert right here in this room, again, immediately immediately after worship. Today is a, a wonderful day where we have a, a, a somewhat of a marketplace uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the church. We have the opportunity to uh, shop at God's Gift Shop, which is an annual uh, thing that we put together that supports our global mission partnerships. And so you can buy alternative gifts that support those partnerships. Uh, we're also excited to announce that Jens Korndorfer has recorded uh, an album, a CD. Uh, it's called Winds of the Spirit. Uh, it was part of the celebration for the organ renewal that we went through these last couple of years. And that CD will also be sold in the marketplace. It'll eventually be sold uh, in the bookstore. Also, Purposeful Pecans, which is one of our Epiphany Social Venture uh, grant recipients. They're going to be here selling their uh, pecans. Every bag of pecans that they sell supports uh, meals for the Meals on Wheels program here in uh, Atlanta. And then finally, as part of the marketplace, uh, we uh, have some folks who are uh, going to talk about the women's retreat that's coming up in January. They're also selling the book that's going to be used uh, for that uh, retreat, and so I encourage you to check out all that's happening right outside here and down this hallway, uh, right in front of the information desk. You'll find all of these um, opportunities in this marketplace uh, working. Uh, also, please note that uh, it's the time of year where we invite the congregation to purchase memorial flowers uh, for Christmas Eve. 
Uh, and so you can do that. There's information in the bulletin, whether in the hard copy or in the soft copy that you receive via text message. It's also in the most recent email blast. The window is not that long, so we're encouraging folks to make sure if you want to honor a loved one, uh, make sure that you uh, get, uh, get connected to our financial office uh, to be able to purchase those flowers for Christmas Eve. We'll also put the names of those loved ones in the order for worship on December 24th. Uh, you also note that our Christmas Eve schedule is out. Please do uh, pay attention to that as some things have changed, but we will worship at 11 a.m., uh, 3.30 5.30 and 11 p.m. on December 24th and have a Christmas Day service at 10 a.m. in the chapel December 25th. Again, it's good to be together today in worship. I'm delighted uh, to welcome three seniors, Zoe Spangler, Addie Anderson, and George Alford, three seniors who are right in the thick of waiting for colleges to get back to them, and they agreed to uh, lead us in the lighting of the Advent candle. From the bulb there comes a flower, from the desert rock a flow of water, from the rainbow there comes the hope of life, from the Bible there comes the word of truth, from the cross there comes the love of God, from the tomb there comes the resurrection, from the prophet comes the vision of new earth. There comes the shoot of David, the lifeline of salvation, the promise of justice, the longing for transformation the word of, of life, the expectation of Messiah. From the stump of Jesse comes a covenant reborn. Let us pray. Um, Lord Jesus, master of both light and darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness, yet seeking the light. To you we say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. Um, the words are on the screen. In this season of prophecy, promise, and preparation, we come to be renewed and refreshed. We come to be inspired by stories of a Messiah who will change the world and change us. We come to listen for words of hope and joy, promise and challenge. We come with open ears, open eyes, and open hearts. We come to receive the blessings God has in store for us in this season of waiting. Come, let us worship our God, the one who brings all things to fulfillment.
join me in our prayer of invocation. God of hope, who brought love into this world, be the love that dwells between us. God of hope, who brought peace into this world, be the peace that dwells between us. God of hope, who brought joy into this world, be the joy that dwells between us. God of hope, the rock we stand upon, be the center, the focus of our lives always, and particularly this Advent time. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning comes from the 15th chapter of the letter to the Romans. Listen for the word of God. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Hear again the word of the Lord. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This too is the word of the Lord. God. Let's pray. Creator God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Break open your word afresh to us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find favor with you. Amen. So good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Little, and I am the Director of Youth Ministry here at First Pres Atlanta. And while I'm relatively new to First, I'm not new to youth ministry. I have been doing this work for seven and a half years, which means the entirety of my professional life has been spent working with teenagers. And obviously, a huge part of working with teenagers in youth ministry involves communicating with teenagers. And one of the most effective ways that I have found to do that is through social media. So I find myself on Facebook and Twitter and mainly Instagram quite often. I'm also a millennial, so I'm sure that has something to do with my social media consumption. But the point is, whether for work or other reasons, from time to time I'll find myself scrolling through a social media feed and occasionally I'll come across a video of unlikely animals being best friends. I'm sure some of you might have seen some of these same videos, 
and they never fail to grab my attention. They depict an unlikely pair of animals playing together, eating together, cuddling together. It's really sweet. Animal friends ranging from dogs and horses to a deer and a cat. I even saw one video of a little piglet that got adopted by a tiger. Yeah. And no matter what I'm doing, nine times out of 10, I'm gonna stop and watch these videos and I don't think I'm alone in this. I think some of you guys might do the same thing. Some of you might have even seen some of the videos I'm referring. And I think you and I stop and watch these videos for a couple reasons. One, because they're adorable. I mean, who doesn't want to see a dog and a duck be friends? I know I do. But I also think there's something more going on. I think the part of us that stops to watch these videos is the same part of us that longs for this to be our reality. We long to live in a world where this kind of peace is the norm. These unlikely animal friends, as cute as they are, are the exception, not the rule. The state of our natural world is such that this type of interaction rarely happens. More often than not, I'm sorry to say, if a wolf encounters a lamb, it's not going to end well. But much like these animal friends, the parade of animals Isaiah shows us is remarkable in part because of its absurdity. I mean, it makes no sense to us. And yet, this is the vision cast in Isaiah chapter 11. A vision of an ideal king whose rule brings forth a peaceable kingdom where predator and prey live together side by side in peace. And it's no secret to you and I that this vision of a peaceful kingdom is not our reality. Isaiah's declaration stands in direct contrast to the terror and brutality that pervades our world and informs many of our decisions, both personal and corporate. We are no strangers to suffering. We are intimately acquainted with the darkness and other predators that exist in our world. The vision Isaiah casts of a peaceable kingdom is not our reality, yet something in us longs for it to be. Especially in the season of Advent, we long for peace on earth and goodwill towards humanity. We long for good news of great joy for all people. We long for justice. We long for what's wrong in the world to be made right. We long for the transformation of all creation from one fraught with turmoil and destruction to one of unity and wholeness. And I think that's one reason why this text shows up in the lectionary the second week of Advent. For everyone who hears or reads them, these verses articulate the deep, persistent human hope for justice and for peace. This prophetic announcement is split into two distinct yet complementary units. The first five verses concern the reign of God through the birth of a new and ideal king from the line of David. The next four verses concern the reign of God in all creation, which will establish peace and tranquility among all creatures, including predator and prey. In the first five verses, we read about the character of this future king from the line of David. And what we learn is that the character of this king will be shaped by the spirit of the Lord. The word spirit occurs four times in only two verses. And the original Hebrew word is ruach. And it's the same word used in Genesis 1 for the spirit that's present, hovering over the waters at creation. It's the same spirit which inspired the prophets and ordained kings and other rulers. This creative, authoritative spirit we read about all through the Hebrew Bible is the same spirit that will characterize this ideal king from the line of David. And we read the spirit endowing the king with gifts, wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord. And these gifts equip the ruler with practical wisdom, sound judgment, and reverence for the Lord that enable this ideal king to act as one who sees and hears 
beyond what's on the surface and to judge on behalf of the most vulnerable in society. These are depicted as the credentials of an ideal ruler. This coming one, this promised Prince of Peace, will be the bearer of the spirit of Yahweh. In Christian communities, these verses are often used to talk about Jesus, which is another probable reason why they show up here in the lectionary. However, in this season of Advent, while we are awaiting the birth of the Messiah, that's not the only thing we're waiting for. We're also waiting for the new creation this reign ushers in. A creation where peace and justice are not only longed for, they're actualized. Verses 6 through 9 depict creatures in a very pastoral scene being led like a flock of sheep. And it contains all this confounding imagery of calves and bear cubs lying together, babies and small children playing near cobras and vipers, lions eating straw like oxen. I mean, this is bananas and a total upending of what we experience the natural world to be. Prey lives beside predator without fear of danger. The predator does not treat prey as something to be used or harmed for their own benefit. This is a compelling portrayal of both aggression and weakness overturned. In this vision of a peaceful kingdom, there is an undeniable tone of unqualified good news and joyful hope. So while Isaiah's vision promises future security, how might this be a word of hope for us today? Well, according to the prophet, the transformation from a culture of fear to a world of peace begins with a stump. Out of something that appears to be finished, lifeless, and left out comes the sign of new life. This is how hope gets its start. It emerges as something small, in an unexpected place, which brings forth the dawning of a new day. A day in which the rights of the poor and frail members of society will be respected. A day when those least able to protect themselves will have full protection under the law. A day when those who are marginalized and oppressed will experience liberation. A day when mourning will be turned into dancing. A day where fear and anxiety will be replaced with deep, restorative rest, a day when predators and prey, both animal and human alike, live together in a peaceful, loving, and just community. In this vision, just rule brings forth a peaceful kingdom. They go hand in hand. And it reminds me of something I've heard said quite often, if you want peace, work for justice. So, look for the stumps. There is hope and new life all around us, maybe in the last place we'd think to look. And my prayer for you and for me this Advent is that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to perceive the stumps all around us, the promises of new life all around us, the people, places, and things God is using to shine a light in the darkness. But today, as it stands right now, we are still waiting for the cosmic renewal and transformation of creation. As Tony mentioned last week, we are living between the times. We're living in a liminal space, a time between what is and what is yet to be. And we feel that tension. Advent is the time of year that invites us to embrace that tension and feel it fully to tap into the longing for what is not yet with hope that it one day will be. And further, to look with hopeful eyes for the ways in which God is already at work around us, even though we are not currently living in an entirely peaceful kingdom, it does not mean that there is not hope to be experienced all around us. Look for the light that shines in the darkness and recognize that it can sometimes come from an unexpected place, maybe even a lifeless stump. I'm not a mathematician, but in my own personal theological math, 
Longing plus faith equals hope. We long for justice and for peace. And we have faith that even though it's not our reality right now, God is already at work to transform creation and will one day fully bring about this peaceable kingdom. And that gives us hope. That is a gift this liturgical season of Advent gives us, the gift of hope. Time and space to acknowledge the realities of our world while waiting with joyful expectation for what God will do and with eyes wide open to the things God is currently doing in our midst. And for that, we are grateful. Because of that, we have hope. Friends, our longing for peace is not wasted. Our waiting is not in vain. Hope does not disappoint us. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you for the season of waiting. We thank you for the beauty of the sleeping earth waiting for spring's new life. Thank you for the joy of children waiting for the excitement of gift giving. Thank you for the gift of familiar carols whose joyful music touches waiting hearts. We thank you for far-flung family and friends that we can't wait to see this season. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We have been waiting for a Savior. We pray for all who are waiting this morning, people who are waiting for an end to violence because they've known too much war, people who are waiting for healing because they live with sickness and pain, people who are waiting for good news because they are weighed down with sorrow. We pray for all of the earth that's waiting. Throughout the world, in and on and under it, waiting happens. Waiting grows and gathers. The earth is longing for redemption. And as we wait, we celebrate the coming of the Christ child and look forward with hopeful expectation to the peaceable kingdom yet to come. May we, the church, be instruments of your hope and justice this season and always. And we ask these things in the name of the one whose birth we so long for, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our hymn while we are waiting. Come. Here is good news. From a lifeless stump comes the dawning of a new day. And may the thrill of that hope cause our world and our very selves to rejoice 
both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.